How's the conference? Everybody like it so far? Yeah! <laughs> oh, there we go. There we go. There. Last, very quickly, last year when I was here, I spent most of the time in, in, in a session discussing what we do with residential properties that are uh, uh, in, in, in some commercial properties that are privately owned. Uh, after a brief introduction here and a few slides and talk about a few benefits uh, uh, for all of us, I, I, I'd like to talk about those which are, which are city-owned uh, and maybe even bank-owned foreclosures and, and what we can do about them and, and what we are doing about them in other locations around the country. Give us, give us little ideas and some, some stuff for, uh, uh, for, for thinking about in the future. Just real quickly, we do, we do several things in our organization. But just as a couple of successes, I want to point out, we have kept out of the landfill over 300,000 tons of building materials since our inception in 1993. <laughs> the average house in the United States, well, first of all, the EPA has estimated that 250,000 houses a year are demolished. The average house weighs about 80 tons. 40 tons of it is in the concrete and asphalt. The other 40 tons are the thing you live in. Concrete and asphalt can get recycled. We've been doing it and, 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 and used for road base and uh, in clean fill. We've been doing that for the last 30 years. The rest of the house, though, the thing we live in that's built with sticks, and two by fours, doors, windows, cabinetry, we can salvage at least day in and day out a minimum of 50% of that and typically 75 or 80% of the thing you live in. So there's a substantial amount of, of, of embodied energy that we can keep out of the landfill. People always say, well, what can you salvage? Well, here's a list, almost A to Z. I never did figure out what Z was in the construction industry, but uh, anyway, we got close, we got to a V. But just to give more of a visual, these are gonna be some real quick shots of one of, uh, actually a couple of our warehouses. Appliances, I don't know if you can see that very well, it's a stack of bricks. Bricks, pavers, cabinetry, doors, Flooring, hardwood flooring. Anybody know what those are, other than houses? Anybody know what they're made out of? Those are garage doors. One time in our history, about 2004, we shipped over 2,000 garage doors to Mexico to have them rebuild their, their houses, which were just tar paper, or they were living in shacks. Um, more material, hardware, HVAC equipment, Lighting, here's how lumber comes in from a job, bulk lumber, available right, right, right to be delivered to the next job or anybody wants to come into one of our facilities and just buy it by the stick, they certainly can. So it's self-service lumber. Plumbing fixtures, roof tile. This roof tile was from a, uh, from a large estate house uh, several years ago in San Diego, California. A gentleman came and bought it all, put it in two containers and shipped it to Hawaii because he could buy it in the United States and ship it cheaper than he could buy it in Hawaii. Windows, vanities. Okay, so it gives you an idea of what we can save. Today's challenge though, and that's where I want to spend the time, the rest of the brief time that we have this morning, is with cities. Urban decay. We've got some real problems with urban decay. We've got blighted neighborhoods. What happens is the reduction in values. That reduces taxes. So now the city has even less money. Yet there's an increase in crime, high employment, and there's more of an existing demand for city services when the tax rates are down. So there's some real pressure on both the top and the bottom with cities, on the bottom from providing the, the expenses, providing the services, on the top from revenue coming in. And finally, no contractors want to go into these areas to help the people clean up. It's too dangerous for them. We actually went into some neighborhoods in the city of Chicago where we had to have a police escort. There we go. This is from the GA, this is a GAO study that it takes about 900 to 1400 dollars just to board up a house 
a single family house. And that's only once. Oftentimes they have to be boarded up quite a, quite a number of times. Additionally, there's an increased demand, as we had indicated in the other slide, police, fire, cleanup, having the lawns mowed, the trash laying around. An example was done by the GAO in Chicago that an abandoned house cost the city $19,227 before that house finally disappears one way or another. Yet if a fire catches, it's almost $40,000. Those numbers are absolutely ridiculous and you, they are absolutely impossible to sustain for a city of any size. Yet, if we demolish, here's the problem. We get back to uninhabitable uh, 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 problems because we are losing landfill space. We're removing all these great materials from the community. There has to be a better way. That better way, I suggest, is through deconstruction. And it can be done in the following manner. Local residents are gonna be trained, and we've demonstrated this, and I'm gonna show you some examples of it. They can be trained to do the deconstruction, right, uh, coming right out of the hood. There's an increase in good human activity. There's always an increase in activity, but uh, this is good human activity. <coughs> Additionally, we can improve the environment by decreasing the noise and saving all the embodied energy. This is the key. Once one house starts to be improved, it's a cycle. It's just like the down cycle. When one house starts to be abandoned, the guy next door abandons, then one next door to that. On improving, the same thing has happened, and I'm sure you've seen that within your neighborhoods. So, let's look at a couple of examples, and we'll go through these. Muncie, Indiana, a little town used to be 180,000, it's now 90,000, an incredible amount of abandoned properties there. Here's what they did. The Community Corrections Department got together with Economic Development, got together with the Dangerous Buildings, got together with the Building Department, kind of unheard of in large cities where there's silos or their departments. But these people could walk across the street or walk upstairs or walk downstairs and talk to each other. Let's get something done. What they did is they wound up with 47 trained workers, 72% of them full-time employed after the program was completed. One local trainer was trained three trained contractors, 42 houses were taken down, and a new retail establishment for-profit was started to distribute the materials and, uh, and hired three of the employees. That's a picture of the, one of the projects in Muncie, Indiana, of the training projects. The other one, Kankakee, Illinois, another small town where very simply, community corrections and dangerous buildings could get together, six workers were trained, 100% of them were employed, and one contractor was, uh, was brought online and is doing deconstruction in Kankakee, Illinois for the city. Harlingen, Texas, fascinating example. Fascinating example. A, a, the college, Texas State Technical College, took over an abandoned uh, Air Force base, had 16, uh, uh, World War II barracks. They wanted to do some training, so they got 10 workers, actually wound up, started with 10, 12, and we wound up with 10 through the uh, uh, Workforce Investment Board. There were 16 abandoned uh, World War II barracks. They took them down in 18 months, saved $235,000 on the budget that was supposedly allotted for the deconstruction of those materials. Those materials were uh, also had a, uh, the hundred thousand dollar savings. The uh, all the materials were used in the first lead gold building on any college campus in the state of Texas. There's an example of one of the buildings. You can see another one in the background here. Another one of the barracks. It was a two story barracks. <clears throat> Greensburg, Pennsylvania. Jack, are you here today? You and Kim. Hey, there you are. Uh, you've got a picture of you here, Kim. Anyway, Greensburg, Pennsylvania. Outstanding organization, the Westmoreland Community Action Organization. We had a training there, and they put together 15 of their employees, put them through a deconstruction training. 
They are now offering deconstruction services in western Pennsylvania. In addition to that, they started their own store, uh, which is a great store, a huge store, selling used building materials that they have salvaged from, uh, from projects and others have dropped off uh, uh, to them. There was one of the couple of pictures of the training session. Uh, that young lady here in the foreground is the uh, same one uh, uh, sitting over there with her arms crossed and being quiet. You recognize that, Kim? <laughs> okay. The other side of problems with, with, the, with the cities are bank foreclosures. What are we going to do about bank foreclosures? We put together a program over the last year and a half, and we've been working diligently on it, is getting banks to recognize that they're not going to sell that property. They've got to take it to dirt. They want to change a, 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 a toxic asset into a real asset, which is just dirt. The toxic is the house sitting there, this abandoned piece of property. They're going to pay for deconstruction. And I'll show you exactly what happened to us uh, on, on our first go around, which was just, just incredible. The beauty of it is all the materials that we salvage out of those deconstruction projects represent a, a Community Reinvestment Act credit for the banks in the neighborhood and that own those houses. We've negotiated with the uh, local cities to reduce their uh, permitting cost and, uh, and allow us to get some redu reduction on utility disconnects. Here's the example. We had 30 properties that were deconstructed for B of A. We were a prime contractor with B of A. We organized some local funding. The demolition cost reduced because we could, what we could, what the bank's problem was, they always had to take buildings down one at a time. Did one on this block, did one on that block, two weeks later, did, they did one over here. But what we were able to do with the bank had said, look, give us your next 30 houses. Then with knowing that we could take 30 houses down, we went to the local demolition contractor and said, okay, look, we want your best bid. Because now you can keep your equipment moving instead of bouncing it around from neighborhood to neighborhood, changing it. So we were able to get the re reduction in, in demolition, and where we needed the demolition, obviously, was removing the basements, backfilling the lots, getting them seeded uh, and, and, and properly covered. And again, the banks received this, this, their CRA credit for it. Here's what the result was. Our negotiated cost for, for uh, demolition, actual hard demolition was $10,000. If we had to deconstruct, and we were capable, and the building was worth deconstructing, we charged seventeen five. We still were the go-to guy for demolition because what we knew is even though this house is in terrible condition and really ought to be demolished, we can't afford to put our crews in there because of liability. The beauty of it is there was always something we could save out of it. There was a large beam, there was some structural material, we could always save something. And the $10,000 exactly matched what the bank was already paying for their demolition. So, so they weren't paying us any more or any less uh, and than, than that. Now, look what they get back in a direct credit. Even the smallest credit that they received paid for a full deconstruction price. So this made a tremendous amount of economic sense, and now we're rolling this program out uh, or anywhere around the country where you've got uh, a city that has some foreclosed properties, you're having problems with the bank trying to get rid of them, we've got a solution. With benefits for all and malice towards none, blighted neighborhoods are improved, local residents trained, embodied energy is, is saved, the remaining residents are improving their homes, the neighborhoods are turning around, We've demonstrated that in, in, in the cities that I mentioned. There's a minimal impact on landfills, and there's a, less, a heck of a lot less need for city services because those, those houses are no longer abandoned. Thank you very much.